Thank you for joining the August edition of Coffee with Coker. As always, it's a privilege to have you join us. Immediately following today's presentation, we will have a question and answer period, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation in the area provided in the GoToMeeting dashboard. The participant phone line will be muted for today's presentation, and the materials will be emailed to you tomorrow. As you exit the webinar, a brief survey will pop up, and we would greatly appreciate your feedback on this presentation as well as suggestions for future topics. Jeffrey Daggerpont, Senior Vice President at Coker Group, will be leading today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you, Savannah. And um, let me start by saying it's always an honor and privilege to um, provide education. We've been doing this for years now, and I've always gotten really good uh, positive feedback. We um, feel this is our way to to give back and uh, we always enjoy doing it. It also helps us um, stay current on um, topics that, that are obviously impacting our clients and certainly cyber security and cyber crime is, is definitely um, a top, top of mind issue concern right now. Over the years we have done a number of presentations on cyber security and cyber crimes and it's always been very technical in nature, um, you know, things that, that from an infrastructure, software perspective. This time we thought we'd take a little bit of a different slant and actually address it from how it impacts the end users, you folks, me. Uh, many people uh, don't know this, but a lot of times we assume that cyber attacks and cyber crimes is happening without your knowledge and it's computer to the computer. It's just somebody getting in through um, a vulnerability and then, then attacking the server. But what a lot of people don't realize is that much of that information needed to gain access is oftentimes uh, you, uh, gotten and obtained through end users, through using deceptive tactics. So I hope that the information we share and talk about will not only help you in your work life, but also in your personal life, and you can share this with some of your associates. I personally um, can tell you some of these scams that are being used, uh, it is very, very easy to, uh, to be deceived by them. And, and you'll hear in just a second the, some of the exact techniques and strategies that they use so you can be on high alert if, if you're to, to avoid becoming a, a victim of one. So let's just kind of get some general definitions out of the way. Essentially, cybercrime, as you would expect, is any intentional attack of an organization's proprietary data, and it's certainly illegal. I mean, it's an activity which a computer is used to commit the crime. And so the way we kind of, if you look at these criminals, um, you know, in the old days, you would have to go into a, you know, a bank to steal money or hold somebody up uh, uh, or rob somebody. And of course, there was that was actually kind of dangerous for the criminal too because they could, they could get shot or they could um, get arrested on the spot. They may be you know, witnesses might see them. Well, these criminals now can operate in a lot of privacy, and in some cases, offshore. And uh, even if you know who, who did it, the, the cost and time and effort and expense to justify going after them is hard to justify because in many instances, if it's ransomware, for example, they may only ask for, you know, a few thousand dollars just to give you back access. So they, they know that 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 making it to where it's hard for you to justify spend a lot of money to go after them is also actually part of the strategy. So cybercrime is is certainly on the rise, and and I personally believe that it's just going to be the new norm. We're going to have to be constantly aware. Uh, in fact, this is not related to IT healthcare cybercrime, but one of the big um, and this may actually uh, really shock a few of you guys. One of the, the biggest crimes happening right now is uh, people will come up to gas stations or you're pumping gas and just ask you random questions about directions or um, you know just make small talk with you. A lot of times those people actually have what's called RFID readers in their pocket and somehow those readers through, um, through Bluetooth connections can actually lift all the data off of your personal information on your credit cards. So you know I, I hate that we're living in a world that you can't even have somebody walk up to you and ask for directions, but if there's anybody that looks suspicious, lingering around, doesn't seem to want to um, leave and make a small talk at a gas pump, that's there's a good chance that they're 
using some kind of electronic device to, to read. And you might say, well, I'll leave my purse or wallet in the car. Those things can read right through um, you know, the, 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 the window and the, and the car door. So they actually um, make now most of the designer um, uh, purses and wallets uh, have a, a place in there or an RFID protector that can uh, prevent those, um, those, uh, those frequencies from coming in and, and stealing your information. Sorry to get off topic, but I was just, as I was thinking of all the ways that they're scamming people, that just, that came to mind real quick. All right, so we know, in fact, it's hard to even turn on the news nowadays you know, story after story, and it seems to be getting, um, you know, the, the, the hits seem to be even larger and larger. I think what is happening is that because a lot of these organizations have actually paid the ransom, they are now becoming emboldened, and it's inspiring even more people to do the same thing. And so when you look at these major corporations that have been hit, which, by the way, tend to spend a lot more money than we do in hardening their data centers, and protecting themselves, and as more and more of these major corporations double down on their security efforts, what the hackers will typically do is um, is just move the software targets. Uh, hackers, by nature, and if you're a hacker listening, don't take this personally, but they're usually lazy people. They're, they're typically um, you know living in their mom's basement. They have no social life. They're um, this would have been what you and I would have done as kids if we TP'd our friend's house. It's just um, a lot of times kids that are just goofing off. And then you do have the actual hardened criminals that do that. And sometimes it starts hacking starts off as a hobby, and then they move into more of the darker side of hacking and, and the criminal side of hacking. Also, it's not uncommon for hackers to work as teams. They will get to know each other. They have their, um, their, their chat rooms. They have their Facebook pages. They share tools. If they find out that one of you were vulnerable, then they all know about it. They all start attacking uh, weaknesses. Like, for example, this is pretty well known and documented, but SRS uh, had a, a security vulnerability. Well, once that was known in the hacking community, SRS is one of the popular EMR vendors out there. Once the hacking community became aware of that, everybody that had SRS was at risk. And you might say, well, how are these hackers going to figure out who has SRS? Well, a little bit of social engineering and internet searches, you know, maybe one of the users attended the user conference and, and made a, a, a Facebook post about it, or maybe somebody put a question on an MGMA listserv and said, do you know anyone that has the same issue? And so once they start trolling around and finding people, it's not that difficult. Now they know you have that product, they know that vulnerability, they've already shared the, um, the, the extracting methods with all the other hackers, and so you get this, you know, avalanche of, um, of attacks that can happen in a very uh, quick, quick way. And as I pointed out a second ago, what they, part of their strategy in a lot of instances is to make the, 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 the compensation or the amount of the ransom an amount, an amount that is not something you want to pay, but is not so high that you would justify spending a lot of time investigating and going after them. And so, unfortunately, they've actually been very, very successful getting people to pay. And I'm going to tell you a couple of strategies here in a second, uh, what you need to do so that if it ever happens to you, you won't have to pay. All right, so this is the part that I really want to spend most of our time on. These are the actual tactics themselves or some of the strategies that they use. So. Most people understand the, the, what's called the phishing concept. It's spelled with a P, but it's pronounced like phishing. And it's just that. They're phishing for information. This is just random electronic communications that they send out that looks like it comes from very trustworthy sources. So for example, they've gotten so good that they can t make a FedEx email look and appear and even create a fake FedEx website that that email has come straight from FedEx. And the email may read something as simple as, we've been attempting to deliver you this package, and we have been unsuccessful. If you would please click on the link below or click on the file and fill out this information and send it back to us, we can deliver your package ASAP. Well, think of the, the staff member who is just simply trying to be helpful for the office. Why wouldn't they want the package to be delivered? It throws them off guard, they click on the link, they click on the file, and there you go. In fact, in many instances, you don't even know that that was the vulnerability that, that you opened up for that hacker. 
that hacker may be stuck in that email, what's called man in the middle, and as you're entering that information, they're logging those keystrokes. So they're already watching what you're doing. They're collecting and gathering information. A pretty common um, tactic. It, most of us have wised up to that. Um, if, if one thing that I can share with you that, that's very helpful to know is if you accidentally were to click on one of those links, a really quick way you can figure out if it's unsafe or not. If you look up in the URL where you see HTTP, if you don't see an S at the end of that HTTPS, that means it's an unsecure site and you want to get off of it very quickly. Um, it hasn't been certified and hasn't been uh, identified by Google or the search engines as, as a safe, uh, safe site. Uh, smear phishing is the concept where they will could potentially target you as an individual. And I'm going to cover this in a little bit more detail when I get down to social engineering. But essentially what this is, is they may find out key information about you and then craft their fake emails, fake communications with you in a way that you will respond based on something you're already familiar with, something that you already uh, trust and, and, um, and, and would be uh, comfortable opening. Uh, for example, a lot of people uh, will have their Facebook account identity stolen. They even take your profile picture and they go set up a second account with your picture and your name and your address. They mimic the whole thing. And then what do they do next? They go through your friend list and start requesting all your friends. And we've all seen on Facebook, somebody has to put the post, hey, if you get a friend request from me, it's not me. I've been hacked. That happens all the time. So that's kind of an, an example of where they are specifically targeting you as an individual, not necessarily to hack you, but as a way to hack other people who know you. So you got to be aware of that. Then there's what's called whaling. Whaling is where they might go after a high-profile individual. This could be one of your doctors. Why would they want to target one of your physicians? Well, they tend to have more money, or they, have, they would not want to deal with something like this. So they may know that, hey, these are high income earning people, let's go ahead and target them specifically because we stand a greater chance of them paying us off and there's um, you know, more money to be, to be um, uh, you know, scammed that off of this individual than say someone who may not be able to afford to, to pay the ransom. And then there's what's called the art of deception. Now this is where it gets really tricky and quite candidly, I personally probably could have fallen for a lot of these things had I not been informed or been told by other security experts that these things are even going on. So for example, one, one uh, scam that happens a lot these days is these um, hackers will come in around your office or in your parking lot. Some even come into your waiting room and will actually leave a jump drive. Forget their jump drive. So look, you know, I'm as curious as the next person. I would have to know what's on that jump drive. And I could easily see where any one of us to try to figure out who the owner of the jump drive is might actually stick it in, the, our, our, our USB port. So the, the minute that happens, they're, they're they, the files start downloading, and you've just infected your office with a virus that may call back to the hacker later. Uh, so you know, it's, it's, it's things like this that you, you really have to be on very high alert and have a, a high sensitivity around things that, that may seem normal uh, you know what? What could be the threat of putting in one of these jump drives, not realizing that a hacker actually planted it there um, deliberately, hoping you would do just that? They've also been known to uh, make appointments with doctors' offices. They will come in as a fake patient. They might say something like, "You know, um, I left my insurance card at home, but I can log into my employee portal and print it off for you." Or they'll even give you the URL to do and you're typing and they may even set up a fake portal and you start downloading those files and that becomes um, uh, the way they get access. This is something that's happening more and more and this again ties back to social engineering. But let's say one of your employees is really disgruntled, they go home and they just put a really ugly Facebook comp post about how they have this horrible boss, they don't like their job and they can't wait to find something new. Well. Hackers are constantly trolling the internet looking for key information like that. That employee may get a private message that night from someone saying, hey, I saw your post, I know you don't know me, 
but I really uh, hate it when employers mis abuse and mistreat their employees. Would you be interested in really getting back at them? And in fact, I could even pay you um, some compensation for, for helping me. That employee is now upset. They want to get you back. They still work for you. They're, they are now working in partnership with the hacker. And uh, you know, you, you like to think that none of your employees would ever do this, but we all have all had, had employees that have been in situations where we've had to worry and be, take concern that they may you know, try to retaliate one way or the other. So now this is not to say that you need to tell your employees not to post things like that, but I'm just trying to make you guys as leaders aware of, of the, the tactics and the strategies and the scams that these hackers will use to gain access to your information. They, they go through all, all different um, methods. Uh, the email scams and what I call clickbait, this is the classic example of this one is a Nigerian prince which you're, uh, that has a similar last name as you. And if you just email them their, your bank account, they want to wire you the, uh, the, 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 the assets and the estate that cannot find anybody to give the money to and they just so, um, so kindly want to offer it to you. Uh, now, we laugh at that, but some people must be falling for it because it continues to happen over and over again. The newest thing is uh, what's called these shock videos, and we see this a lot of times show up on Facebook. Um, if, you're, if you're in a group on Facebook, you actually see it more often in like some of the, um, the yard sale groups or the, um, the uh, just different uh, public groups that, that like your, maybe your uh, community, like in, in uh, Forsyth County where I live, there's a group on Facebook called uh, The Voice of Forsyth where residents can all make comments. Well, hackers love those sites because they can post videos. In fact, they recently one uh, I saw the other day actually made up a fake news story that said 11 people shot in Atlanta uh, road closures, uh, and and it just kind of and they actually gave a, an image of what looked to be a police scene. And my gosh, if you're in Atlanta and that comes up on your feed, you're going to want to know what's going on. And so again, they're 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 hoping that they can cause you a brief moment of putting down your guard a brief moment of having judgment that would normally make sense. Why wouldn't you click on that link? The minute you click on it, it probably is routing you to an unsafe or a fake website or a place where people can get information or they use that as a back door to take over your computer. Once they take over your computer, your computer is then hooked up to your network. They can then take over the network. Uh, so be aware of these shock videos or what I call clickbait. The chain Email stuff is not as popular as it once used to be, but we all have that one relative that, for whatever reason, wants to continue to send those emails that say, it, it usually starts off that you will get a, a you know, a, a, a big fortune will come your way, but you have to send this, forward this email to 10 other people, and if you don't forward it to 10 other people, you won't get your big fortune, you will die, and Jesus doesn't love you. So you better forward it on. And everybody who reads that keeps forwarding on and on and on and on. And what's happening there is the hacker is part of that email chain. And so what they're doing is they're trying to figure out who in your network of electronic communications do you frequently communicate with. So let's say you copied me on that chain. Well, the next thing the hacker is going to do back to you is make an email account that looks very similar to mine and will send you an email. Well, hey, you know Jeffrey, so why wouldn't you open it? It looks familiar, but the name's going to be slightly misspelled. And so, again, they use those tools and tactics to get information, and that's how they target end users. They're hoping that you let your guard down. They're hoping you fall, fall take a bait for some, you know, uh, trick to make you think you have to forward this email to 10 other people so they can gather information about you and your friends and use your friends information to, to trick you. The last thing which I want to talk to you about is the concept of social engineering. This is actually something that any one of us, this is, has nothing, to, I mean obviously it applies to protecting your office, but this is important for you to protect your, your, yourself, your, um, your, your own credit, your, your own privacy, uh, what this is, is is that we, every one of us nowadays are creating very big digital footprints on ourselves. Every time we go post something, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you have a LinkedIn account, 
if you're using Skype, if, uh, if you're going into any news organization and you're commenting on their blogs or you're commenting on the stories, you're basically putting your information out there. Nothing wrong with that. I don't want to discourage you from doing that. But what you do have to be aware of is there are trolls who are monitoring, watching, and looking for vulnerabilities. For example, this is an actual real story. There was a lady who made a post, a very unfortunate post, about her sister that was just diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And she was asking people to please pray for her sister. Nothing unusual about that. You see posts like that all the time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sad and it's unfortunate. Well, what hackers will do a lot of times when they see something like that, they know that once a person is emotional about something, they are almost much easier to put their guard down. So when this lady made the post, it was also known, based on her Facebook profile status, where she worked. Well, so now he knows something about her, her personal life, that her sister has ovarian cancer. The hacker figured out where she worked. He then went to her employer's website, and based on the website, he could tell that everybody's email address for that company was first initial, last name, at cokergroup.com. Let's say she worked here. And now he knows her email address. He knows where she works, and he knows personal information about her, very emotional personal information. Well, do you know what this sleazebag did? He created a fake benefit flyer to donate money to people with ovarian cancer. Now, tell me that's not the, the dirtiest thing in the world to do. And he emailed it to her. And do you think that she would have thought twice about clicking on that? Absolutely not. Her sister had ovarian cancer. She wanted to support that. And she clicked on it. And that's how they got infected. And so. It, it, it's horrible to think that people are that dirty and, and that low, but that's, that's what they do. And that's why it's very tough in many instances. You can invest, have all the investment in hardware, software, monitoring, um, ultimate security. You can have the top-notch security. But if they social engineer one of your employees or you personally and trick you into giving them access, there can be some real consequences and that is where why this is becoming such a big challenge for companies is that you don't just have to guard against your your uh, your IT ecosystem you also have to make sure your employees are very aware, well aware that there are people out there targeting them doing um, unethical things like that to trick them into clicking on information that's unsafe now there are safeguards and you should have ways to scan and confirm that those emails coming into your organization are not at risk. Practices that we work with that have the most viruses and are getting attacked the most are ones where you're allowing your employees and physicians to use their Gmail accounts, their Yahoo accounts, because those rely on out external uh, virus scans versus um, not controlling it when it hits your firewall and hits your environment. Uh, in, some, in some cases, people are using their personal devices, so their home computers get infected. They then bring those computers to the, to the office, and that's the Trojan horse method that they get into your practice. And again, the practice doesn't have any way of monitoring or alerting them that they have a virus that, that may be uh, giving, uh, creating uh, opportunities for hackers. So the malware concept is where the computer itself obviously does the dirty work. Uh, you'll hear terms like um, man in the middle, man in the keyboard, man in the cloud. These are uh, tools, viruses that can get loaded, that can actually watch every keystroke that you're making. In some instances, I've even uh, heard that they can even remotely turn on your cameras on your laptop. Um, in fact, that you may have saw it got a little press a, a while back that uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook actually had a piece of tape over his laptop camera because he's fearful that if somebody ever hacked his, his computer, they would be able to actually activate his camera and watch everything going on in his house. So, you know, again, I don't want to make everybody live in fear, but we are living in times where the industry is trying to, to get ahead of, of, of these problems and, and, and challenges. And, of course, there's a lot of benefits to automation. We're going to continue to do more automation. We're going to be, be more dependent on technology. But the more we automate, the more opportunity it creates, and, and which is the second thing on the list here, 
which is the ransomware. This is has proven to be very, very profitable for hackers, which is why you're seeing it happen so often and so frequently. And um, this is probably as good a time as any to tell you what is the, your best strategy. So the basic concept of ransomware is they, it's, it's done two ways. One is they just completely put something to disable your system completely. You go to it, it's locked. You can't do nothing. You can't restart it. You can try to restart it. The same screen comes back up. There's a, you know, a way to contact them, and they're going to demand money from you to unlock your system. They almost always are holding a copy of your data, too, or information about your practice. And they will threaten you that if you don't give them the ransom in so many days, they will publish that information. Now, knowing that you paying them will do will will serve nothing other than a temporary maybe a temporary unlock, but they're going to come back and they'll come back again and again and again. There's nothing that's going to stop them. So there's no way you can trust these are not good people. They're not just going to accept your ransom payment and say thank you very much. We'll leave you alone now. Not only will they say not leave you alone, if they do already have the data, they're already going to sell it and release it on the black market anyway. So there's nothing you can do to prevent that. Trust me, you're not going to sit down and sign a contract with them and say, okay, I paid you the ransom, now give me back my data. Even if they gave you back your data, they probably already have a copy and it's going to be sent to the black market regardless. So what a lot of organizations are starting to do is simply say, I'm not paying it. Just, you know what? I, I am going to have to go through the process of notifying my patients. I'm probably going to have to spend some money to buy credit monitoring services, but I'm not going to pay you. And you might say, well, wait a minute. How are we going to get our stuff unlocked? Basically, you would have to essentially wipe your hard drives and completely restore everything, which means that before you, for a critical success factor in being able to not be a victim or restore is to have an absolute solid proof backup and disaster recovery that's separate from your existing network, meaning that if your primary network got attacked, if it got locked up, if they held the data, you could tell them to go fly a kite because you have another copy of your data to restore from. The vast majority of the hacks that have been devastating is that the hackers were not only able to lock down the current system, they were able to wipe out the backup copies and everything else because those backup tools were also on the client's same network. So. Many people now, and there's inexpensive services that can do this, that can offer remote backup, off-site storage of your data, and keep it separate from your existing network. So that way, when you do tell them to go fly a kite, you're not paying it, you can restore from a copy of data that you already have. Now, the tricky part is, oftentimes, true redundancy and restoring from backups is not always in real time. So depending on when the last backup was, you may lose a day or two days. In some cases, it could be a week. So the other thing that people are doing now is they are, they are moving their backups to every 12 hours. And that data is stored off-site. It's kept usually an administrator takes it home and puts it in a fireproof safe. You're putting it on an encrypted you know, NAS device or a, an external hard drive that can be password protected. Uh, or you're leaving it in a, in a vault at, at the office somewhere but it's separate from the network so you can actually restore from it. The other thing that we're seeing more and more, and this is happening now I guess with politics, is that you have nations, companies, that uh, other nations that are attacking our companies, attacking our politicians, attacking you know, um, you know, DNC headquarters the, the, as, as they suspect the Russians may have been the one that attacked um, you know, um, the DNC recently. And then um, something that is becoming more and more common is what's called hacktivists. These are people that just simply don't like what you do. Let's say you work for, you know, I don't know, maybe a hospital that, um, that does abortions and they're an anti-extremist you know, extremist group is really attacking that. Or maybe you're um, um, uh, opening a new building and you're going to do some construction and a, and a Greenpeace activist really hates that and they don't want to see you. To, they, they're, they're, you know, mad because they think you're uh, tearing up the environment, so they attack you for those reasons. Uh, these are just people that are, in most cases, and this isn't a left or right thing. They trust me; both sides have their have their hacktivists, but these are generally people that are just really angry and, for whatever reason, have a, will have an axe to grind against you for something you're doing, typically business-wise. Um, you know, it's it's um, 
it's, it's not uncommon these days to see uh, uh, for the news media to eat this stuff up to because, and even sometimes the media will have hacktivists to try to break into, uh, you know, uh, wasteful spending or maybe it's a particular politician that's um, going to back uh, passing a hospital bill that prohibits doctors from owning hospitals. Those kind of things that that might be a political interest. So we'll see we'll see more and more of the hacktivists come up. And then of course once they get your information, as you guys are well aware, they will uh, use it, sell it. Um, you know, if you think about information on just a basic face sheet that any one of us has filled out in any doctor's office we ever been to, it's usually our full name, address, social, date of birth, next of kin, where we work. Um, in fact, if we ever paid with a credit card, that number is on file. It literally is enough information that the hacker could have uh, to apply for a loan. Uh, the, you know, on the personal side, you know, typically what, what we are at risk for is just the identity theft, which, by the way, is an absolute nightmare if that's ever happened. It usually, they'll run up your, um, they'll take credit cards out in your name, they'll go buy stuff in your name. Uh, you know, creditors, despite the fact that they know it wasn't you, they may still try to come after you, or it could take, take months to clean up your credit um, if, if they did run up large balances. Uh, there are things like LifeLock and other solutions like that that can help you monitor that. Um, I actually signed up for LifeLock, LifeLock a couple years ago, and in addition to monitoring my credit, I can actually I have a setting on there that says nobody can ever open up any account in my name unless they personally call me, and um, and I they have my phone number, so I get calls if I apply for something. Uh, that bank or whoever's trying to open up the account must call me and verify that it's actually me. Which is really, I've I've had I've actually had a call and it wasn't me. Uh, the other thing that's really cool about LifeLock is they can it'll tell you if there's any sex offenders that move into your neighborhood. They'll tell you if there's any you know tax liens. They can actually tell you if there's any uh, information being mentioned about you on and uh, on the internet that might be negative. They can help you with that. And of course, if you are uh, if there is a security breach and someone does steal your identity, they can actually help you and assist you in cleaning it up. The medical identity theft, um, big business, huge business, They um, because it's so rich. I mean, it's so data rich. And not only is it data rich, sometimes it has um, ties back to personal information. So let's say somebody hacks your office and maybe, let's say you're, I don't know, an infectious disease clinic. Well, they could use that information and blackmail somebody, uh, one of your patients, into paying a ransom before they go tell their employer or something like that. So, you know, that's why in, in healthcare the stakes are so much higher because not only do we have all that same personal information, we we have very sensitive information that could affect people's jobs, their ability to get life insurance, just a lot of things that, that could really harm people if it was made public. And then there's what's called uh, industrial espionage. This is where, um, you know, you see a lot of this out of uh, probably Asia more than anything. This is the, the knockoff Rolexes, the, the fake Louis Vuitton purses where they actually steal patents, they steal designs, they go in and steal um, you know, um, formulas that, that, might be, that we use for uh, creating our medications, things like that, and they gain access to that and then they, do, they, they, um, they, they create a, a replica of the product. And in many cases, these replicas have gotten to the point where, you know, it, it, you, you really can't even tell that they're fakes. That they've gotten that good at, at replicating them. I mean, sometimes there's quality issues there, but, but they've, um, they, they steal that too. So, you know, that doesn't really apply as much to healthcare, but uh, it does for our medical research and stuff like that. So we know our greatest threat is our electronic protected health information, which we obviously want to start protecting. We know there are tools out there that will help you. There is inexpensive tools that you can enlist. In fact, the company that we use once a year scans Coker, and you'd be surprised at how many of our associates have viruses in their computers that we have to go in there and clean up. Uh, some are dangerous, some are not dangerous. But you know, we travel a lot. We work with our, you know, we use our computers at home. We're always in airports. Um, it's it's the the tool that they use, and I'd be happy to introduce you to them just simply goes through and crawls and comes back and says, here's, where, here's what's infected, here's what you need to do to remediate. It's not a catch-all, but it's definitely proactive. We don't sit around and wait 
for the virus to show up or wait to react to it. We're trying to be proactive. And by the way, even if you cleaned up every single virus in your environment today and put all the security that you could possibly think of, within time, it's, it's not uncommon for that to fall back because people get new emails, people get new laptops, people go outside of your network and, and attach to Wi-Fi networks and they come back up. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, if any of your employees are using their personal devices, their iPhone, their iPads, their laptops, or working from home, any electronic device that attaches itself or touches your office is subject to e-discovery in the event of an audit. So make sure your human resource documents make your employees aware that if you were to be audited, that their personal devices may be looked at and, and be subject to those audits. So, you know, um, I say that because, you know, people may have something embarrassing on their personal computer they don't want everybody else to see. Or maybe you need to make sure that, you know, there's a computer for business and a computer for personal use. You don't want to co-mingle the two. Um, you know, people don't like carrying multiple devices. We, as a company, we get the choice. We can use our, our personal devices to, 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 for email, which we do, but our companies made it clear that that, e that that device would be subject to an audit. So and we accept that. So um, and if we didn't, then we'd have to carry two devices. So that's that's the that's the rule. Uh, you want to develop communications with your staff. This is something I know. There's not a lot of people. Um, only so many people can attend the webinar. But I I I get asked all the time to come out to practices and give an in-service at one of their staff meetings to talk about the social engineering to make people aware of what these, these dirt bags are doing and how they're scamming people and how to create education. Um, this is not only going to benefit people in their, in their work life, but even in their personal life. It would be an absolute honor and privilege to come and, and do some of that education, even if it's over the web. But, um, uh, and, and there's a lot of good information over the internet that you can start sharing with your staff. But it's really, really important that your staff is aware of these tactics. Because remember, some of these tactics are taking advantage of people's emotions. They're hoping that they can use something to cause a person to lower their guard. Uh, you've probably watched these videos of these kids that have been trained by hours. I mean, we all have told our kids, don't talk to strangers. Don't ever go with a stranger. Whatever. I mean, we, I, I have a six-year-old. I'm always talking about stranger danger to, that, my, to my six-year-old. But time and time and time again, when they show hidden videos of strangers going up to kids, the stranger will oftentimes say something like, can you help me find my lost puppy? Or, oh my God, your mom's been in an accident. You have to come with me. They're trying, it's the same kind of concept. They want to use something to throw you off your guard, to cause you to not have the best judgment in that particular moment, and they want to get you in a moment of weakness. And that's the tactic that they use, and unfortunately, it, it, it works on a lot of people. So make sure your staff is fully aware of how to spot it and how to um, uh, minimize uh, being a victim. So prevention strategies, education is key, helping people know what to look for, both in terms of what could be happening to them as well as the office. Absolutely, 100%, without a doubt, if you don't have this now, start immediately. Get a very solid backup plan and process in place. Remember, if you do get attacked by ransomware, I, I don't want you to be in a situation where you're going to be forced to pay just to unlock your system. You can have other alternatives because they're still going to give your data away anyways. So now if you can't restore it, then unfortunately you may have no choice but to pay it to get it back and then, and then hopefully never be in that situation again. But if you have a really good backup, one that's very close to the time that you got attacked, you can oftentimes restore from that and just tell them to, like I said, go fly a kite. Make sure that you have up-to-date, very sufficient antivirus, anti-malware detection tools. We have monitoring tools on our network, very inexpensive, that will alert us to any kind of threat that comes our way. So again, it, you want to take advantage of this if you don't already have it. Monitor your devices, monitor your servers. There's no way any one of us can keep up with everything that's going on. Also, we can't be watching our computers 24-7. These electronic monitoring tools can do it for you, and um, they're actually pretty pretty decent in terms of uh, early prevention as well. And then this is not going to be something that you can just do, you know, one time and then then you know uh, 
put it on the shelf and, and forget about it. You're going to have to continuously update policies. Um, there's always going to be new viruses, always going to be new scams. There's always going to be something that, that they are, it seems like they're always a few, few months or years ahead of the, um, the, the, the people that, that offer the protection. Um, it's like when ATMs first came out, there actually was a, a glitch. You could actually draw out money out of one ATM, and if you could get to the other ATM within five minutes, you can make a second withdrawal before it, it reconciles with your bank. So anytime there's new technology, hackers are always figuring out where the weaknesses are, and they can usually get to those weaknesses before the industry can fix the, fix the patches. Um, other strategies, you know, besides antivirus, make sure your firewalls have web filtering. Remember, the vast majority of these hacks are coming in through social engineering tactics by fake emails, through fake attachments, through the social engineering guy that, that, that made that fake flyer for ovarian cancer. Those are the ways that, the most common ways. So if your filters are, are, are working properly, they should know how to protect um, dangerous emails. And oh, oh, by the way, don't think that just the traffic coming in, it's also traffic going out. So what is, you know, is your, could your website be vulnerable? Maybe there's a particular a uh, website that you, a software vendor that you're using, and that vendor has a virus and it's pushing it out to you because you connect to it. And, you know, look at your firewall logs, see what kind of suspicious activity is going on there. Uh, that may give you some tips where, where things may be, you know, needing to be uh, remediated or, or, um, or, or examined for, for any threats. Um, you know, if you have a local IT support person, they should be offering you, you know, reports and, and providing you um, a service that, that helps you with the monitoring. If you don't have one or you're relying on your vendors, I can definitely give you some, some recommendations on, on where to get some help in this area. The vendors are helpful, but remember the vendors are only typically responsible for their software. And in fact, one area that we don't pay a lot of attention to is what is the vendor's responsibility? Let's say the vendor set something up wrong, or maybe you're using a cloud-hosted software, and they get attacked, and it's your patient's data that um, was exposed via their network. Are they responsible for that? Do they have insurance to cover that? Do they have to notify you? How soon? Will they pay for the credit monitoring service that you have to now buy for all your patients? Um, you know. There's things like that that what if one of their employees becomes rogue and, and, and misbehaves? They have to be responsible for those things. So check your contract, and if you're not sure, I'd be happy to look at it for you and tell you what you need to do to get proper protection from third parties uh, that, that could create risk and vulnerabilities for you. Because, you know, that stuff is completely outside of your control. And if they cause harm, then not only do they have to help you cover the cost, they're also going to have to be part of the remediation. And so you want to make sure contractually they're held accountable to that. You might want to look at your tickets that, you know, these can oftentimes tell a lot about what's going on in your organization. Uh, something that may not appear as a, as a uh, security threat could be, uh, you know, something uh, can look differently to someone who's a trained IT expert. Um, you know, so, some of the questions that, that, you know, are some of the things you want to obviously do. And this varies depending on the size of your organization, but a lot of groups are now putting together a cybersecurity team that can help look at risk, that can oversee uh, vendors, oversee contracts, oversee your strategies, provide the education, make sure that you know doctors using their own devices are not sending text messages back and forth that uh, are about patient information, things like that. If you do have an incident or you want to go ahead and know what your response to an incident is. We didn't really cover HIPAA and cyber, uh, the HIPAA security and privacy rules. In fact, I may even offer that as another Coffee with Coker webinar later. But me, part of meaningful use and part of your eligibility for meaningful use and part of your ability to keep your meaningful use money, meaning they can't come back and ask for a refund, is you do have to demonstrate that you are doing security assessments. And that security assessment must conform to the HIPAA requirements. There's a lot of documentation on what that is. Now, there's some, there's some mixed opinions on whether or not 
you should have your vendors and your IT company do that, or whether it's not, it's best to have a third party do it. The reason why is, is that you're really wanting to check everybody's work. So if I set up your network and I don't know I set it up wrong, I may not ever know that that's a risk, where if you get a third party to do it, then it, you have a little bit of a, an, an independence objective. And should something happen, you can then say, look, we engaged a third party. So you get a little bit of an arm's length besides them coming saying, oh, you did it yourself, and you didn't know you were supposed to do this, and why didn't you do that? You're much more accountable when you didn't, if you didn't do it right versus you could blame somebody else for an honest mistake. Um, you always want to test and evaluate and know how to respond. So how to respond, for example, depending on how many records, you might have to notify the media. You almost always have to notify the patients. You almost always have to take some kind of precaution to avoid it. Generally, the, 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 um, what gets people in a lot of um, uh, expensive fines is HIPAA and the government understands that there's that that there's no such thing as a 100% cyber crime free network environment. Accidents happen, honest mistakes happen, and these criminals are are very good and very savvy. So when you have an incident, let's say for example, the security breach happened because one of your doctor's laptops was stolen from their car. That can happen to anybody, and it's no fault of the doctors. It got stolen. The next thing they're going to ask you, well, okay, we understand that's an honest mistake. It happens. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Tell me about the encryption on that laptop. Was it password protected? Can you remote wipe it? Do you have um, authentication on it? And if you're not able to demonstrate that you took the proper protocols and action to protect the data on that laptop, that's when they're going to really come down hard. They're not going to uh, really make that big of a deal if you had an honest mistake and you can demonstrate that you pr properly protected the laptop, what they what they get really upset about is when there's there's this complete negligence that you didn't even bother to put a password on it. And that's that's an area that they're not very forgiving because they would expect nowadays a reasonable expectation is that you must have, you know, authentication on these laptops and devices that leave your office. Um, yeah, obviously you can engage other people in sharing information. Review your insurance coverage. Uh, everybody, it's not uncommon for your insurance to offer cyber crime, cyber uh, crime insurance. And in many instances, the insurance will even cover the remediation, will cover the cost to provide the uh, credit monitoring if that has to happen. Uh, last but not least, number seven, I will be more than happy. In fact, I will be honored and privileged if you want to send me your contract. I'll not only look at if whether or not the vendor can be accountable, we can look at other things like how to future-proof it, make sure it's going to be compliance with new meaningful use requirements, MIPS and MACRA, make sure you're entitled to future versions. I can even tell you if the vendor is nearing end of life or is you know going to be positioned well for the future. So the advantage of, of sending me the contract is it enables me to gather information about things that affect you guys, our clients. And, and by creating that transparency and sharing the knowledge, it's one way that we can we can all help each other out. So don't feel bad. Take full advantage of it. I get a lot, lot out of it and benefit a lot from it as well, too, and would be happy to do it for you. Final thoughts. Everybody's vulnerable, even yourself on a personal level. You know, but at the same time, we got to live our lives. We got to pump gas. You know, we have, um, you know, we're going to pick up jump drives. Uh, you know, we're going to, you know, unfortunately have to make, you know, maybe make posts about sensitive things, emotional things that, that someone may use that information against us. Uh, just just know that there are, you know, very dark people out there that, that will exploit that and they will take advantage of that and they will look for t attacking you when you are at your weakest. And that's oftentimes the, the, the strategy that's very common and, and what is typically used to, uh, to gain access to your data. Um, the experts say, and I know this sounds very grim, but all the experts will tell you, you're probably already hacked. I mean, think about it. If Walmart's uh, Target, Sony, all these major corporate, I mean, who hasn't gotten a letter that said from somebody, your credit card company, that says, hey, our data was uh, breached and our records were affected and you may be you know, a subject to this breach and here we are notifying you. So 
you have to almost assume that hackers already have our personal information because there's been so many breaches. So because of that, that's even more of a reason to be on high alert because we've given it. And look, I'm, I'm a very realistic person and I'm just as guilty as this. Most everyone's username now is our email address, right? Because it's easy to remember that. And by the way, if you forget your password, how do they send it back to you? Through email. So I get that. Now the password is an opportunity for you to create some extra layers of security. It needs to be complex, symbols, letters, capital letters, numbers, you know, long. Make it, you know, uh, combined. Don't use, you know, the most common word, password is password or one, two, three, four, five, six, or ABC, one, two, three. Uh, our, doc, our practices are sharing, you know, one password for several people. So you want to make sure your passwords are complex. And then there, typically there needs to be a second or third layer so the password gets you into your device and then there's another layer of security that gets you into your applications and all that authentication needs to sync up. Have a, a, uh, a plan for preventing as well as detecting. Detection is the real key because you want to know about it when it when you get infected and have the ability to have early intervention. Assuming you don't detect it, then you want to have a plan to remediate and continue to improve and fortify and harden your IT ecosystem. And so your strategy should include what it is, why it's important, what your governance is, your policies. You might even want to have a, a, a cyber information officer that can have a, a role to do this. If you're not big enough to have someone full time, you can subcontract it. Uh, we do fractional uh, cybersecurity work all the time. You don't need to have someone on your payroll full time. There, in fact, most of this is spot work anyways, so there are resources out there that's available to you. And like I said, if you want to send me the contract, uh, please do so. It would be an honor and privilege and would love to, um, to, to send it to you. Um, one question that has come through is, um, uh, oh, the tools. I, I'd rather, the tools for monitoring, there's several. It, it kind of depends on what your IT, if you're hosted, on-premise. A lot of people now are moving to the cloud. So there's different tools. Just shoot me an email and I can actually introduce you to the company that does our cybersecurity. And I want to say, um, I, the name is slipping me, but the way it works is they actually attach an agent uh, or an appliance, I'm sorry, and that appliance crawls through everything attached to your network, your iPhones, iPads, desktop, printers, devices, EMR practice management system, firewalls, and it is just trolling for anything that looks dangerous. And it comes back, not only tells you everything that looks dangerous, it will tell you if your um, antivirus is expired, if your Windows updates are behind. So rather than you trying to go in and, and, and do this device by device, it can actually give you a very nice report and, uh, and have a lot of information available to you. So one, somebody's asking if the person logs into the Wi-Fi, that uh, does it, it create risk for your office? And the answer is maybe. It, it, it definitely can. That's why in a lot of hospitals now, or even hotels and networks, you will see that they have actually set up a guest Wi-Fi. And if your employees want to attach themselves to it, those employees should be recognized by your firewalls as authenticated users. But guests will sometimes come in and ask for the Wi-Fi. And in fact, I, didn't, I should have mentioned this, one very popular scam is there are people that will just troll parking lots with these little sniffers and they'll sniff out uh, wireless access points that are just broadcasting in the parking lot. And I am shocked at how many times they are just completely wide open. So if the user is not authenticated on your network and you're just letting anybody connect to it, they, they, you are creating some risk for yourself because sometimes I can connect to a, a practice's Wi-Fi network as a guest or even on their own if they didn't encrypt it and it actually shows me where the servers are, how many computers are connected, it tells me the names of the computers. I can show it in the network mode and it shows me everything attached to it. So um, definitely be careful with that. Uh, the, the best scenario is to set up a guest network for your employees and, and, and uh, patients that may want to come in and have internet access. Um, somebody had asked uh, about how does this tie back to meaningful use. 
Um, so, so security audit was always part of the meaning for use. And it's gotten more comprehensive as the years have gone by. So there's a uh, there's two parts to the audit: the security and privacy. The security is going to make sure that you have all the proper infrastructure, passwords, encryption, antivirus protection, and you actually have to attest that that security audit was completed, and you're verifying that all those proper protocols and protection is in place. The second part is privacy, which is your policy your business associate agreements, they're going to ask you, does everybody have access to PHI? Are they under a business associate contract? And, and you know, if you say yes and they're not, then you have basically, um, you know, uh, attested incorrectly and could be subject to refunding that money. Of all the um, reasons for people to fail a meaningful use audit, it's almost always on the security assessment. They didn't take it serious. They just went through and hand it to their IT person, and the IT person said, yep, we do this, we do this, we do this, and there was one or two computers that it wasn't the case on. It's, a, it's one of the easier audits for them to come back and say, well, okay, you said you have a business associate agreement, can you produce them? Well, we have this new vendor, or we didn't get it for this one, or I didn't think this one needed it. It's a pain in the butt, but you have to get every everybody who has access to your PHI under a business associate agreement. You're required to do that by law. And so, you know, that's something that many people forget about and, and it, it catches them in the audit. Uh, okay, I think that's all the questions. So and we're actually right about at our ending time. So let's do this. If you think of something afterwards, just shoot me an email. My email address is there. Definitely take advantage of the contract review. I don't mind doing that. We'll be honored to do it. Uh, many of you, I may if you're past clients, I may have even helped you do your contract. I'd be happy to, to, to do a quick update as things have changed a lot since maybe we did your first one. Um, also, if you have, uh, if you do want some input on these monitoring tools, uh, send me that email. All I need to know is if you're hosted on premise and what EMR practice management vendor you're using, and then I'll uh, introduce you to uh, to the company that that does it for us, and um, and they can give you more information on pricing and whatnot. So thank you guys very much. You all have a great rest of the week, and we look forward to doing more education in the future. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that presentation. Like you said, if you have additional questions, you can feel free to reach out to Jeffrey directly. Again, we would appreciate your feedback on this presentation through the survey as you exit the webinar. Uh, the slides of this presentation will be emailed to you. Thank you again for joining us today.